In 2002, a horrific crash killed Norman Samuel's wife. In the operating room, um, um, they just couldn't save her. The disaster, also hitting other families, would be blamed on Goodyear's G159 tire. It is truly the worst truck tire made in history. And Goodyear knew by 2000, the end of 2000, they knew the tire was defective. More than a decade and a half later, Goodyear says the tire is safe but there's a federal probe and claims of a cover-up. Today, we're finally ending the NAFTA nightmare. NAFTA is out, and the new U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement is in. There's more North American components. There's more jobs in the United States. There are more businesses, dry cleaners, restaurants. This week, what the New Deal really means. They're the products we use every day. Makeup, deodorant, shampoo. But who's policing what's in the bottle? You would think that they would potentially be among the most regulated, but it's just not the case. This week, why some say an outdated law may allow toxic products to stay on the shelf. How in the world could you turn a blind eye to something that is so important? Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. If you've been around a while, you might remember the deadly Ford Firestone tire fiasco. The law on reporting tire safety issues was changed because of it. Today, there's a federal investigation you probably haven't heard about into a different brand of tire, Goodyear tires once used on motorhomes. Goodyear says the tires are safe, but there are serious allegations of a cover-up. It was a perfect day for me driving. And uh, golly, we, uh, we got all the way into Alabama and we were about 30, 35 miles out of Tuscaloosa. Norman Samuel's wife was driving their motor home in 2002 when they heard a pop. It was the sound of the tread peeling off of one of their Goodyear tires. The rig dropped down on the, on the left front and my wife yelled out to me, Norman, I can't hold it, we're gonna crash. And I said, you know, just do the best you can. It'll, it'll all be okay. It wasn't. They had a catastrophic crash. His wife was pinned in the driver's seat. She was talking. She was wide awake. Um, it was um, um, tough. I could see her head starting to swell a little bit from where she had impacted the windshield. And her left foot was severed completely off. It seemed like it took for an eternity, but the ambulance finally did get there, and uh, she went to the, to the hospital, and she was conscious the whole ride in. Um, but in the operating room, um, um, they just couldn't save her. She was just too far gone. Her, her head was damaged that much. Samuel, whose dad ran a service station, says he was always a stickler for checking and taking care of his tires. How did you come to believe the tires were defective? Well, when I saw the when I saw the tread, actually, I was at the hospital, <clears throat> and uh, a buddy of mine, who was a truck driver, heard about the accident. He had the presence to go back and, and get the tread, and um, you know it might have been a, a tougher case to prove if he hadn't have found that. But you could put the tread together, and it made the entire tread was all in just one piece. It turns out the same disaster was hitting other families. In 2003, the Hagers crashed their motorhome in New Mexico after the tread tore off their right front Goodyear tire. All four family members inside were hurt. Donna Hager, the grandmother, still suffers from her injuries 17 years later. She was trapped in the rear with a broken jaw, wrist, teeth, foot, ribs, toes, and a severed Achilles tendon. Attorney David Kurtz took the Hager case and received a confidential settlement from Goodyear. But instead of that ending the story, it was only the beginning. You're saying that Goodyear misled the court. There was data showing this problem? Oh, absolutely. By the time the Hager's accident happened, there'd been over 450 uh, highway speed failures of the G159. But you didn't know that? I did, had no idea. The court battles over Goodyear's G-159 have now spanned two decades. 
Kurtz has argued in legal documents that the tire is linked to at least 98 injuries and deaths and hundreds of property damage claims. And the case against the tire maker has expanded into a federal investigation and allegations of a cover-up. The G159 is a tire that was originally made for what? It was made for stop-and-go delivery vehicles, uh, like a FedEx truck. But it began to be used for something else. It also, that particular size, fit on motorhomes. And so uh, Goodyear sold it for that application. What was the problem with that? Uh, the tire, uh, when it was uh, released, uh, was not subject to any kind of high-speed testing, but it has a temperature limitation that it can't uh, exceed. And that's not a problem when you're stopping and starting in inner city traffic. But when you get out on the freeways, uh, it would ex generate excess heat that would slowly degrade the tire until the tread separations fall. Charges of cover-up come into play because Goodyear hid that key information from the Hagers. It turned up later when a watchdog group called Safety Research and Strategies poured through documents in a Florida case. At highway speeds routinely traveled by motor homes, Goodyear tests showed the G159 tires generated heat that would be, quote, cause for concern, though thousands of tires were sold for that very purpose. Understanding we started our lawsuit in, Hager, in the Hager case in 2005. 2012, we finally got the tests uh, uh, that showed that, that Goodyear had been hiding for years, that showed uh, um, temperatures in excess of 250 degrees um, when traveling at freeway speeds. You allege that Goodyear conspired to keep safety information secret from the public and federal authorities. How? The uh, federal regulation is pretty, and it has been for a long time, it's really straightforward. It says, if you believe there's a defect related to motor vehicle safety, you have to tell the government within five days. And Goodyear knew by 2000, the end of 2000, they knew the tire was defective. Armed with the new information, Kurtz launched a multi-pronged attack that included new lawsuits against Goodyear and going to the feds. It didn't take long for a federal judge to agree that Goodyear and its attorneys had cheated the Hagers and owed them $2.7 million in penalties. Goodyear appealed and both sides are still fighting over the amount of the final payment. The trial court judge found the Goodyear team made repeated deliberate decisions to make misleading and false in-court statements and conceal relevant documents. The little voice in every attorney's conscience that murmurs, turn over all material information, was ignored. Kurtz filed a separate fraud case against Goodyear where he questioned Goodyear executive Linda Lovell. We're on the record, the deposition, Linda Lovell. Were you aware that there have been over 600 property damage claims alleged to have occurred as a result of G159 failures? I don't have the specific number, but I'm aware that there were allegations for property damage claims and there were allegations for death and injury. And each one of those, we worked to understand what could be causing those incidents. As we do with any allegation for property damage claim and any allegation for death and injury. It is truly the worst truck tire made in history to the best of my knowledge. Uh, the most uh, common information people know about is the Firestone failures back in the year 2000 that led to some federal legislation called the TREAD Act for public safety for tire failures. And to the best of our calculations, a Goodyear failure rate is 27 times worse than the Firestone. Goodyear settled the fraud case for a confidential amount, but the whole controversy was still far from over. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, opened a preliminary investigation into the G-159 based on information Kurtz provided. The failures may stem from a safety-related defect, wrote NHTSA. Claimants contend the Goodyear G-159 tires were allegedly not designed for extended use at highway speeds, as would be experienced during motorhome operation. Goodyear declined our interview request, but said in a statement, Nothing is more important to Goodyear than the safety of the associates who produce our products and the consumers who use them. We continue to believe that there is no safety defect with the G159 tire. We are fully cooperating with NHTSA on their investigation. It's been 13 years since Goodyear settled Norman Samuel's case for a confidential amount. 
He says he still finds himself looking at random motorhomes to see if their tires are G159s. Goodyear is a huge company and employs thousands of people. And um, I'm sure that, uh, that most of them are just as, as great as they can be. But somewhere along the line, somebody slipped up and they've let this thing, I think, kind of snowball and they didn't take the right action at the right time and save some people's lives. NHTSA wouldn't tell us what's next, but if Goodyear is found to have been deceptive, it could owe up to $105 million in penalties. Ahead on Full Measure, safety questions about cosmetics and lotions. But up next, what a new trade agreement with Mexico and Canada means for us. On the heels of a new trade deal with China, President Trump has now signed the United States-Mexico-Canada Trade Agreement, USMCA. It's an update to the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, and is being hailed as a big win for businesses, farmers, and other workers. Economist Peter Morisi breaks it down for us. If you don't mind, USMCA 101. USMCA 101. The old NAFTA uh, needed to be brought up to date. Okay, because... let me stop you right there. What is NAFTA in okay. a few sentences? The old North American Free Trade Agreement with Canada and Mexico was in need of update because we've got a whole technology sector that didn't exist before. And uh, we've got the problem of China. Uh, China can send steel into Mexico, it finds its wealth way into cars, and comes into the United States. And it's, it's not like it's fairly traded steel, it's subsidized steel. And the same thing goes on with a lot of other components. So the USMCA deals with that by requiring more of the content of the vehicles be made in North America to qualify for duty-free trade. Everybody said this was a deal that could not be done. Too complicated, too big, couldn't be done, we got it done. And today we're finally ending the NAFTA nightmare and signing into law the brand new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. Very special. Very, very special. It also addresses the China problem in another regard. If either Mexico or Canada signs a free trade deal, or if we do, with, 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 Ch with China, then they're out of the deal. And so my feeling is, is that it creates a North American bloc similar to the European Union without all the excess baggage of the European Union. What specifically do we get in our relationship with Mexico that we didn't have before with the USMCA? We get higher content in the automobiles that cross the border. There'll be more American components in them. And that helps promote businesses and factories here in the United Absolutely. States? Absolutely. If there's more North American components, there's more jobs in the United States, there are more businesses, dry cleaners, restaurants. When a factory's humming, there's that dinette down the street. What is it we get in the part of the deal with Canada that we didn't have before? Better market access in agriculture. Uh, the original NAFTA, the, the original deal with Canada, uh, gave us more market access than we'd had in the past, but it limited it. This improves it further. Can you explain in very simple terms to people why trade agreements are necessary? Well, the reality is that we'd have tariffs at the border, the goods would be stopped at the border and checked and so forth. Uh, the amount of two-way trade between the United States and Canada is so intense that the economies of Michigan, Ontario, and New York would be severely impaired if we didn't have an arrangement that erased the border. Uh, likewise, we have an interest in Mexico developing economically so that we don't have an immigration problem. If we either get, take their goods or we, get, or we take their people is what it comes down to. Uh, and uh, this permits Mexico to integrate itself into the U.S. economy, learn American practices. Uh, it improves the labor environment in Mexico. And all those things are good things from the point of view of having a more prosperous neighbor. You know, do you want a prosperous neighbor living next door or one that's not prosperous? If you want a prosperous neighbor, you want the USMCA. Canada has not yet ratified USMCA, and due to political upheaval there, it will be months before it takes effect. Coming up on Full Measure, we use personal care products every day, but who's policing what's in the bottle? Josie Sturman has a surprising report next. trust that the shampoo, deodorant, lotions, and cosmetics we use are safe. You might be surprised to hear of a gap that has allowed potentially toxic and untested products to stay on the shelf. 
Josie Sturman investigates. And now we come to the thrilling final episode of our radio drama. America in the 1930s. Radio was the main form of entertainment. An average house cost $4,100, and a gallon of gas was about 10 cents. In that decade, President Franklin Roosevelt broke new ground by signing the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. At the time, it would be used to combat questionable remedies like crazy water crystals, sleepy salts, and veneered chicken. But when it passed in 1938, the law was missing one key piece. It did not give the Food and Drug Administration the authority to police the consumer products that line the shelves of your bathroom and vanity. To this day, the agency says it still can't. We use multiple products multiple times a day, and so you would think that they would potentially be among the most regulated, but it's just not the case. Melody Benish of the Environmental Working Group says there's no category of consumer products that are less regulated than the soaps, lotions, and makeup we use every day. The FDA doesn't have registries of these companies and their products. No. They don't have the authority to do recalls. No. They don't have a systematic look at the ingredients and what their long-term effects are. No. They are supposed to be looking out for the health and safety of the American public. It's not happening. Hairstylist Wynn Sisk got out of the business after realizing a straightening treatment she was using on customers was making her sick. Our eyes were burning, our throat was burning. But no warnings on the box, nothing that said it contains this harmful chemical. Not at all. Turns out it contained formaldehyde. The chemical, a noted irritant and possible carcinogen, is found in many hair straighteners. Despite investigations and hundreds of complaints, it still hasn't been banned by the FDA. How in the world could you turn a blind eye to something that is so important? And there are other examples that show the agency's lack of power when it comes to personal care products. Deadly asbestos. After our Providence station found asbestos in Claire's makeup marketed to kids in 2017, it took the FDA more than a year to confirm the hazard and issue a warning. Even then, it couldn't force a recall. With a possible health risk involving one of the most trusted products, baby powder. And while Johnson & Johnson has long said its baby powder is asbestos-free and safe to use, lawsuits have alleged a potential link between the product and ovarian cancer. In one case just last year, a cancer patient was awarded $300 million. Johnson & Johnson is still facing 16,000 additional cases. Still, the FDA has not issued or required a warning. The agency says it monitors the market for products that may pose a risk and is asking manufacturers to start providing information about how they ensure their products are safe. It says it can work with the Department of Justice to get products off shelves, but it doesn't happen often. Washington has long wanted a change. Bipartisan bills have repeatedly been introduced in both the House and Senate with more recent versions designed to give the FDA the authority to do mandatory recalls, to force companies to turn over information about health problems reported about their products, and get the agency to review chemicals of concern five at a time every year. We don't know what these ingredients are. Senator Susan Collins of Maine was among the sponsors of a bill proposed last year that lawmakers hoped would more heavily regulate personal care products. I'm always very hesitant to write new government regulations, but this is an area that really cries out for regulation because consumers cannot possibly make informed judgments on the myriad of chemicals that are in personal care products. The existing framework that we use is in fact working. It is delivering safe products. Jay Ansel is the vice president of science for the Personal Care Products Council, a trade association. He says the industry is not unregulated and says the vast majority of products are safe. Still, he says major industry players support modernizing the law. Cosmetics are not regulated the same as food and drugs, but that hardly means they're unregulated. I think the industry uh, can be proud of, of what it's done, uh, but people want to see uh, uh, some of these voluntary initiatives become uh, mandatory, and the FDA, you know, in the 21st century should have uh, more tools. So if these bills have bipartisan support, why haven't any of them passed? 
Well, like many things, this comes down to money. If you want the FDA to investigate and to regulate, they're going to need people and resources. So some of these bills have included fees that all of these product makers would have to pay. Obviously, not everyone's a fan. All right. Thanks, Josie. Next on Full Measure, an incredible underground discovery between the U.S. and Mexico. An update to our reporting about Roundup. Thousands of people say a chemical called glyphosate found in the weed killer gave them cancer. But there's disagreement among experts. The EPA recently reapproved Roundup as safe, saying glyphosate is not dangerous when used as directed. Even so, Kellogg's recently announced it will phase out using Roundup on wheat and oats due to safety questions. Last year's study showed several popular cereals contained traces of glyphosate. Lawsuits about Roundup are currently on hold as settlement talks are reportedly moving forward. On Full Measure, we've reported on Mexican cartels using tunnels to traffic drugs and people underground into the U.S. An update, border officials have announced they found the longest such tunnel ever. Customs and Border Protection says the tunnel starts in Tijuana, Mexico and stretches into San Diego, California, more than three quarters of a mile. It's about five and a half feet tall and two feet wide and 70 feet under the surface. They say it was a sophisticated operation with a rail system, air ventilation, an elevator and a drainage system. So far, no arrests announced. Next week on Full Measure, conservative Glenn Beck helped shape political and social commentary, but with his sky-high ratings came controversy. Now he's talking about the campaign to take him down and why he really left Fox News. I went from, in 2007, uh, that poll that comes out, you know, around Christmas time, most admired men in the world. And I was a number three or number four. I remember I was between Nelson Mandela and the Pope. And I remember thinking, this is screwed up. But I went from that to exactly a year later being despised by so many people. Glenn Beck on politics, media, and the news next week on Full Measure. Now there's a new way you can watch Full Measure on our new streaming service, Stir. You can download the app on your phone. It's also available on Roku, Apple TV, and Fire. So now you can watch Full Measure anytime, anywhere on STIR. And a reminder that we've started a podcast offering inside information on our stories and how we go about our reporting. Check out Full Measure After Hours on your favorite podcast distributor. Until then, thanks for watching. We'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable.